In 2018, 841,233 people in Ireland told the Oireachtas to repeal the Eighth Amendment of the Irish Constitution, which stated that a person and the fetus living inside their body had an equal right to life. Four years later, it took just nine Supreme Court justices to move America half a century in the opposite direction, overturning Roe v. Wade and effectively banning abortion in half of US states, despite 57% of Americans disagreeing with them. Much like what toilets trans people use, whether or not someone carries a child to term is simply not a problem for the majority of ordinary people. In fact, the Catholic Church only started caring about it relatively recently. Nor is it a moral crusade. Rather, abortion is a crisis manufactured by the upholders of white supremacist patriarchal capitalism, including the religious right, but also the police and carceral system, conservative and indeed liberal politicians, to keep people in their place by keeping fetuses in theirs. Understanding this can help us explain how it came to be that a socially conservative country like Ireland liberalised its abortion laws while the self-proclaimed leader of the free world restricted them. It also explains why struggles around abortion aren't over in Ireland or anywhere else. Camilla Fitzsimons works at Maynooth University in County Kildare and is a pro-choice activist. Strange, then, that the title of her book, Repealed, Ireland's Unfinished Fight for Reproductive Rights, published in November by Pluto Press, makes no mention of abortion at all. The reason, as you'll hear from our conversation, is to correct a tendency latent in pro-choice movements to think of abortion as a single issue, a right that all people should have access to. Following in the footsteps of Latinx and black feminists of the 70s onwards, Fitzsimons argues that a person's right to an abortion doesn't exist in a vacuum, but instead is conditioned by things like their class, race and legal status. We need to think not only about enabling to terminate abortions, in other words, but why certain people end up needing them in the first place. Offering an honest critique of a movement she's dedicated years of her life to, Fitzsimons admits that Together for Yes, the umbrella organisation that formed around repeal, made major errors in centering liberal feminism and reinforcing the marginalisation of women of colour, travellers and migrants, among others. That doesn't mean she's given up on the movement. We conclude our conversation by looking at how the intersecting crises currently confronting us, from the refugee crisis to the cost of living crisis, offer an opportunity to build a truly representative feminist coalition. I'm Rivka Brown, commissioning editor and reporter for Navarra Media, and you're listening to Navarra FM. I hope you enjoy the show. Your book opens with people like Leo Varadkar taking credit for the repeal of the of the Eighth Amendment shortly after the announcement and sort of rewriting history about the role of uh, elected politicians in the um, in the movement. Um, but as you say in the book, actually, the campaign for abortion rights in Ireland um, had been organising for you know, almost half a century by the time that repeal actually happened, um, and in fact, you know long before the Eighth Amendment was even introduced into the Irish Constitution. Um, And so what I'm interested in is what kind of particular combination of factors came together in 2018 uh, to finally repeal the Eighth Amendment. You talk a little bit in the book about um, the 2011 Occupy movement and the 2014 Right to Water campaign um, that mobilised masses of people as maybe some of the catalysts, but I'm really interested in, yeah, why 2018? First of all, you're absolutely right. The campaign was not just since the Eighth Amendment was introduced, but you've got to look at even before that. So you had an anti-amendment campaign right back in, in the early 80s. And 
uh, former president of Ireland, Mary Robinson, for example, who many people will know, was very involved in that. But I mean, I think, yeah, it's an interesting question. What what was it about 2018? And what I would say was that the game was up by 2018. Well, actually, the game was up by 2016. So Leo Varadkar, who you mentioned, former um, Prime Minister Taoiseach of Ireland, uh, he was one of the last people to declare whether he was for or against repeal which really captured how the political establishment behaved all the time, which was they just didn't want to lose this. They were so concerned with staying in power and maintaining votes that they hedged their bets for as long as they could because of what turned out to be a false fear that the Irish electorate would, um, you know, would reject repealing the eighth if they put it to the people. So I think the game was up. I think abortion pills, You cannot ignore how much abortion pills changed things in Ireland and are changing things in the United States in terms of uh, overturning Roe. It's a very different landscape to things like the 60s when, you know, legislation was introduced in the UK or when uh, the Roe v. Wade ruling happened. So they knew the game was up because abortion pills were circulating freely in Ireland. They also were under significant pressure from Europe to do something about this. There had been a number of high profile cases through the European Court of Human Rights. There was a statement by uh, the chairperson involved in one of the select committees where he really, the, the expression, you know, treating women as a vessel was really taken on board in Ireland because this was a direct quote that came from, um, I can't remember the person's name, Nigel. Um, I'm sorry, now I can't remember his name, a, a, a senior person within the European courts. And he really was very critical of Ireland using, um, he spoke about rape victims, so rape victims being used as a vessel. So the game was up. You also had absolute 35 years of a grassroots movement constantly bombarding the government, constant demonstrations, constant acts of civil disobedience. And, you know, they really escalated after the death of Savita Halapanavar in, in 2012. I think that is was a real tipping point in terms of activism when, you know, a lot of people really understood the implications of uh, a ban on abortion. Mm-hmm. It's interesting you mentioned Roe v. Wade here because, you know, It begs the parallel question, how four years after Ireland, traditionally a religious and quite conservative society in many ways, um, had uh, repealed the Eighth Amendment, did America come to roll back abortion rights? You know, are are these two contexts so completely different that um, one could be going forward whilst the other is moving backwards? Or are similar forces at play, but just their kind of, you know, the point in the power balance is just, you know, we're just at a different moment. You know, obviously the religious right and the um, the kind of liberal left exists in both those societies, you know, in, in quite um, large numbers. You know, the American religious right is enormous. But so how... How did how did these two things happen in tandem in opposite directions at very similar times? I think you're absolutely right to, to look to Ireland to understand what's happening in the United States. Because when the Eighth Amendment was introduced, so the Eighth Amendment was a ban on abortion that was enshrined in the Irish Constitution. When that was introduced, it was a very small, well-resourced group that managed to really manipulate things to have that amendment put in. So yes, the Eighth Amendment was introduced by popular vote, but just over 50% of the electorate turned out. It was a very small number of people that voted. So more people didn't vote for the Eighth Amendment than did in Ireland. And the lesson for the United States is how a small, well-funded, powerful group of people, supported, as you rightly say, by right-wing Christian ideology, can have such an incredible impact. You know, poll after poll in the United States show that the majority of people are in favor of abortion access. You have a group called Catholics for Choice who have found that the majority of Catholics are in favor of 
the availability of abortion. So I think the real lesson is that this is orchestrated. This is not a change in public opinion, what has happened in the United States. This is a very well-funded, small group of people who incidentally have spent, uh, I think the last estimate I, I saw was that they've spent $280 million a year they're spending outside of the United States to bolster the groups that were active in Ireland. So pro-life organizations, and I'm using, I'm putting uh, inverted commas, as I say, pro-life, but also the, there is a growing um, anti-abortion movement in the United Kingdom. And a lot of that is being supported by uh, right-wing fundamentalists in the United States. So I think it's really important that we don't think that public opinion in the United States has changed. I think we have to understand it's exactly what happened in Ireland, a small group of dedicated people. It's the same thing that happened in Poland in 2020, a small group of dedicated, well-funded people, very, very determined, who managed to implement this terrible regime, which women and pregnant people die when you ban abortion. Mm -hmm. It's interesting you talk about the legal kind of um, campaigns, I suppose, that these very small, well-funded, right-wing, often religious groups kind of, um, you know, uh, undertake. Um, Because there's also, there's this paradox or there's this tension, um, I suppose, in that, you know, you say in your book, Repeal, that um, whilst, you know, there are these, the, as you say, the 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 right wins by not by changing public opinion, but by undertaking very targeted lobbying of lawmakers uh, to implement, you know, small but very significant changes to constitutions, to statute books, and so on. But progressive and left wing movements can't respond to this purely by being drawn into legalistic battles against laws which you know themselves are flawed and shouldn't be there in the first place how does the left manage this tension between fighting the rights legal kind of lawfare you might describe it whilst also not becoming um sort of blinkered um, and solely focused on a legal uh, and drawn into a legal battle with the right, which can only afford us very limited freedoms. You, you know, you're right again to, to, to point out there is a very definite role for the left, but I think we have to look at how we define the left. So again, to look to the US, the Democratic Party, you had statements from Joe Biden after Roe was overturned. You had, you know, what some people are saying were crocodile tears from from other people. But they had many, many years in which they could have done something about this if they really wanted to make abortion free, safe, uh, legal and local. They had lots of opportunities to do this and they never grasped that nettle. So I think we have to be clear who we mean by the ne- left. And I don't think that is true Parliament. I mean, there have been some very significant changes through Parliament. In Ireland, I speak about the role of people like Ruth Coppinger. I know um, Stella Creasy in the United Kingdom has been very uh, central to what's happened in Northern Ireland in particular. But I think we know from history that sustained pressure from a left that is built outside of um, traditional politics does work. It worked in Ireland. It will work in other countries. Uh, And I think that is where we have to put our efforts. We have to have a very simple and clear demand. Abortion is health care. That's not a radical thing to say. That's the position of the World Health Organization. And we have to be very clear it does not belong in the statute books. It belongs in medical guidelines. You can introduce, you know, to decriminalize abortion, to fully decriminalize it and take it out of the statute book doesn't make it a free for all. It means that it's regulated through the usual channels that regulate all sorts of health care. So it doesn't belong in the legal books at all. And I think people who fight for abortion access need to be very clear about that. If we waste all of our energy tweaking bad laws, it is important work, but it burns people out. It also focuses people on the single issue of abortion. And we need to look much broader than that at reproductive oppressions, 
at uh, reproductive justice, that, that idea that, you know, it's more than just abortion. Again, if you look at the UK, so figures are rising in the UK. So more people are, are accessing abortion in the UK. And it's hard not to link that to um, housing insecurity, job insecurity. Uh, these are the factors that impact a person's decision whether or not they can they can go through with, with the pregnancy. So I probably went a little bit of a roundabout way there in answering your, your question. question. Not at all, actually, because my next question was going to lead right into what you're talking about now, uh, this idea of rights versus justice. Um, because, you know, we know very well that in America, for example, the rallying cry of pro-choice activists is my body, my choice. Um, and, you know, I was reading an article in N Plus One magazine, an American magazine, about the rollback of abortion rights there, um, which was sardonically entitled, Your Body, My Choice, My Body, Your Choice, even. Um, and in that article, um, the author, a woman called Dana Tortorici, writes, we face the moral obligation to protect each individual's right to liberty and self-determination, to comfort and happiness in their own body, regardless of the law. Um, and, you know, this language of individual liberty and personal autonomy really starkly contrasts, for example, the language of the Latino activist that you cite in your book um, in New York City, who in 1974 formed the Committee for Abortion Rights and Against Sterilization Abuse, or CARASA. Uh, and they argued that the right to abortion was one of many rights, reproductive and otherwise, rights that you've just mentioned to housing, um, you know, to a good wage and, and so on, that working class women couldn't access and that framing the fight around the single issue of abortion ignored the structural forces that impinge on individuals' ability to access their rights in the first place. And, you know, you, you talk about how Carassa's work then was built upon in the 90s by the women of African descent for reproductive justice, who, who were the first to create this kind of reproductive rights framework. And you know, you've done it a little bit already, but can you talk us through the kind of key differences between a rights-based approach to abortion and a justice-based approach to abortion? Um, and then maybe how the two kind of interacted or uh, or didn't interact in the campaign to repeal the eighth. So there's a big difference between a reproductive justice approach and a reproductive rights approach. Reproductive Justice is based around three fundamental rights, the right to have a child, the right not to have a child, and the right to parent in a way that you want to, to parent as you choose. And I think you're right, the history is very, very important. So the history of this movement came from women of African descent. Uh, it was uh, at the time when Hillary Clinton was quite involved in promoting a reproductive rights approach in promoting that individualist model that you talk about. I mean, I don't think this, I, it is my body, it is my choice. I don't want to, you know, distance myself from people who use that expression. But I think by expanding it into those three areas, you really illuminate, you know, I'm a white middle class woman and I was able to choose my pregnancies, choose whether or not to have children in the comfort of having enough money, having a house and being in a stable relationship. But there are many other groups in, um, in Ireland and historically who were denied the right to parent as they choose because of welfare checks, because of poor housing, who were denied having children because Ireland has a long history of uh, incarcerating women. We had uh, mother and babies homes. We had Magdalene laundries. We had many, many women in Ireland were incarcerated. I write about this in my book and were denied the right to have children. Many women in Ireland went to the UK, pregnant, came back childless. So a reproductive justice approach broadens the conversation to say, well, what are the conditions under which a person can decide whether or not, as I said earlier, to proceed with the pregnancy. The problem with the Irish situation was the campaign to repeal the eighth very much went with a reproductive rights model. 
So the image that was conjured up for people was a woman sitting with her doctor in a nice, comfortable surgery and weighing up her choices as to whether or not she would go through with this. And that is really, really far from the reality of a crisis pregnancy that many people experience. As you know, imagine we have a housing crisis in Ireland at the moment. We have uh, 10,000 people living in emergency accommodation. And that is a big number when you look at the population of Ireland is less than 5 million. It's a huge number of people. So imagine living in a hotel room with two small children, trying to hold down a precarious job and finding out that you're pregnant. You know, a reproductive justice approach locates the person within those circumstances and says, we need to look at housing, we need to look at the quality of work, we need to look at borders and how they impact people's capacity to have or not have children. So it's a very left-wing approach, it's a very radical approach, and it is important to confront the more conservative you know, Biden approach, the approach that, that Joe Biden is currently embodying in the United States, which is that, you know, singular person uh, making a moral choice. Because if it's OK to say something about the, the kind of moral, the moral argument, I mean, we will never agree on the morality of abortion. There are people who think it is wrong and will always think it is wrong. That does not change the fact that Abortion is a normal part of reproductive health care. It has always been there. It always will be there. If you try and ban it, if you try and put any sort of barriers, all it does is impact the poorest people in society, the people who are furthest away from um, you know, urban settings, the people who are in coercive relationships. And if you take something like the, the Roe v. Wade ruling, um, what it does is it actually puts women's lives at risk who are in late stages of pregnancy, who have pregnancy complications because you create this chill effect for doctors and they don't know how to behave for late miscarriages when women are unwell. Um, so, it, you know, banning abortion does not take it away, does not reduce the numbers, does not mean it doesn't happen. It just makes it dangerous. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the sidelining of grassroots groups in favour of a kind of more liberal front to the repeal campaign, you talk about Together for Yes and how, um, you know, groups like the National Women's Council and kind of more neoliberal um, feminist models took centre stage in the campaign for repeal? You talked a little bit about the, um, you know, the messaging reflecting that. Do you genuinely think that that, that kind of liberal image was necessary to mainstream the demand for repeal or not? You know, there are also people that you cite in your book who say that repeal and together for yes, appeal to this kind of imagined white middle class Irish voter that maybe existed, maybe didn't exist. And um, but then again, some might argue that you do need a kind of palatable face in order to to win a majoritarian, you know, a referendum in that way? It's the million dollar question that we will never know the answer to. The reasons why organizations like the Abortion Rights Campaign came together with Together for Yes was to create a united voice. And I absolutely believe a united voice was important and potentially led to the substantial victory where we had over 66% of the population voting for repeal. In the research that I did, when although I so I researched a lot of people involved with Together for Yes, although a lot of people had some problems with the message, you know, 90% of people thought a united front was the way to go. And if you look at the anti-abortion movement, one of the big problems that they had in Ireland was that there was more than one group, they were divided, they started to fight with each other. So Together for Yes absolutely created a very, very strong united voice. And I, as much as anybody else, got behind that voice. I think retrospectively, we have to just remember the importance of that. Could we have done more to, for example, highlight um, the role of racism in the death of Savita Halepanavar? Probably. Um, what do we do moving forward? I think we try and learn from that and, and not make that 
mistake again. But I think, you know, you have to look at sort of bad faith criticisms of the Together for Yes movement, which came from people like, you know, you mentioned Leo Varadkar earlier, but there were, you know, mostly male um, journalists uh, who were very critical of the Together for Yes movement. There was one journalist who wrote, you know, it'll never win because it's led by women or, you know, it needs a strong charismatic leader. In other words, it needs a man in charge. So there's that kind of bad faith criticism of the Together for Yes movement. And then there's the more good faith internal critique that needs to happen within reproductive rights movements, which moves towards that reproductive justice approach that we talked about earlier, and which doesn't leave behind um, Irish travellers, migrants, disabled people in our message. Because what has happened in Ireland is that, yes, abortion was introduced in 2019, but Ireland has one of the most conservative abortion laws in Europe. And the people who struggle who struggled when the Eighth Amendment was in place are the same people who struggle to access abortion in Ireland now. So, you know, yes, Ireland liberalised its laws, but we don't have a good law. We don't have a good law in Ireland. I mean, in the UK, there's almost an excuse for it because your law was introduced in 1967. It was a very different historical context in terms of even things like, you know, the nature of the procedure was, was so much different. We have significant restrictions in Ireland, which are against World Health Organization guidelines and which continue to impact um, people who couldn't access abortion before 2019. So we still have seven people traveling to the UK every week from the island of Ireland. This is actually, I mean, also you say it's got one of the most restrictive laws. I mean, one of the most obvious instances of that is the fact that the limit is 12 weeks rather than in England, Wales and Scotland where it's 24 weeks and you say this is also counted from um, very early on in the pregnancy long before people um, have missed their first period and so people might only have known for a couple of weeks by the time their the limit runs out so this is like an incredibly short time frame to even permit abortion in um, your 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 remarks just at the end there just um, kind of make me want to ask in broader terms, you know, what has changed in the four years since the referendum? Have things gone forward or have they gone backwards? You know, we've had a pandemic happen in between um, the referendum and now, one that has in some ways expanded access to abortion because of telemedicine, but obviously for other people will have restricted it because of lockdown and shielding and, you know, the um, compounding pressures that being already marginalised um, can have during a global pandemic. So, yeah, I'm really interested in what what has happened in Ireland in the four years since. So the reproductive rights movement in Ireland is still alive and kicking. And because of that, the changes that have happened since 2019 have been sustained pressure to make our law better. So there is a review of abortion legislation in Ireland happening this year. It's happening at the moment. This was promised around the time of the referendum. When the review was announced, there was an immediate attempt by the Irish government to water down the terms of what was agreed and what was actually said in Irish Parliament in 2018. So because the reproductive rights movement in Ireland is still alive, there was an immediate and united backlash to that. So we will watch that space for the review that is happening at the moment which will hopefully remove some of those barriers that I mentioned earlier that is being independently chaired, which was one of the main demands of the reproductive rights movement. It also is asking for evidence-based submissions uh, rather than some of the complete nonsense, to be honest, that anti-abortionists tend to submit. The other change that is happening is that we are introducing safe access zone legislation in Ireland Again, this is only happening because of sustained pressure by reproductive rights organisations. Can you talk a little bit about what that is? Uh, This is the exclusion zone around... um... Basically, you draw a circle around an abortion provider and you ban protests outside in Ireland. It means outside the doors of general practitioners because GPs are the main providers of abortion in Ireland. 
since abortion was introduced in Ireland, there have been these silent vigils, there have been demonstrations with people with um, small crosses, there's been what's called curb, um, sidewalk counselling, it's called, in the United States, where people approach uh, women who are um, entering reproductive rights, uh, or sorry, reproductive health care settings and try and shame them. Um, and they, they claim they're trying to talk them out of their decision, which is really very patronizing, both for doctors and for people seeking to access abortion. So this law stops that. This law bans that. Uh, it's actually a very progressive law. It's only happening because of sustained pressure by the abortion rights campaign, by an organization called Together for Safety and by other grassroots movements. And there's actually... You know, important lessons here for the United Kingdom, because those protests are on the rise in the United Kingdom. There's some really good research done by uh, Pam Lowe and Sarah Page about the increase in these protests. And the laws in the UK are very patchy on this as well. So that's a significant change that's happening in Ireland. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They're the positive pieces. Yeah, yeah. I still remember, actually, I used to work near Googe Street and there was a Mary Stopes um, abortion clinic um, on my walk to work and every day there would be a, a silent Catholic vigil there. And yeah, yeah and, and this was like years ago now. Um, I'm sort of wondering, actually, how much attention you pay to what's going on in the UK um, and whether you see, I mean, you mentioned in passing that abortion rights are under threat here. I don't think it's a threat that many people take seriously at this point. Although, obviously, you know, with people like Jacob Rees-Mogg, stridently anti-abortion Catholic, father of many children, um, you know, now kind of rising rising up the ranks of the Tory party. I'm sort of wondering whether people will start to take it more seriously, but you know, how, how under threat do you think abortion rights are in the UK realistically? So would it be okay for me to just comment quickly on what's not working well in Ireland and then to, to roll into the UK? So I've, I've identified the, the impacts of sustained pressure on the government, but what's not working in Ireland is that many people uh, who have poor housing, who have um, coercive relationships, who have care responsibilities, are not able to access services. We have a situation in Ireland where only around 15% of GPs are providing abortions. Uh, this is probably linked to the, the vigils we mentioned earlier. We have a situation where only 10 out of 19 maternity hospitals are providing abortion, and the Irish government is doing nothing about this. So I would say these are publicly funded hospitals. You need to sanction them for not providing abortion. So there's good and bad happening in Ireland. What's good is the sustained pressure. In terms of the UK, I think it's important to always remind people that abortion is a criminal offence in the United Kingdom, except for in Northern Ireland. But it is a criminal offence. Uh, and at the moment, uh, my understanding is there are two women facing charges in the UK there are, I think the most recent figure I read was that 17 women have been questioned by police in the last few years. And the laws that they're being questioned under, I mean, you're looking at the 1861 law that was originally put in place. So, you know, many people in, in, in the UK don't realise that it is still a criminal offence. And I think until that is lifted and until that is changed, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a big issue. I think you have a situation where if a person takes an abortion pill at home uh, on their own without medical supervision, which is something that is, you know, happening all of the time, they are afraid to go to a, an accident and emergency setting. If something goes wrong, they're afraid to go to a doctor because they can and will face, face criminal prosecution. I also think the overturning of Roe has emboldened the right. I think uh, the money that is flowing out of the United States, some of that is flowing into the United Kingdom. Uh, I think Teresa Coffey is the name of one of the um, emerging um, MPs in the UK who is anti-abortion. So I think you, I think there's a need in the UK for the reproductive uh, rights movement, for feminist movements, for social justice organizations. Let's keep it out of that silo of, of abortion to to watch that space and to pay attention and not, 
excuse me, not only ally with people overseas, like the 300,000 uh, people, mostly women now affected by the overturning of Roe, but to look around them, to look in their own communities and say, who is struggling here? Who is not able to access abortion in our own countries? And also look back at that figure of the increases and say, why are people having to make this choice in the first place. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, oh, I think I'll have an abortion today. It's not a situation that people want to be in. So again, how do we look at the broader factors that, that, are, that are impacting this? But I, I truly hope that in the UK, I think there is such strong public opinion that it will mobilize if there is any attempts. I know there was a recent attempt to organize anti-abortion groups on university campuses in the United Kingdom, and it didn't take off. And I think these are important things. I know there's uh, organizations in Scotland and in other parts who are actively campaigning for better uh, laws around safe access zones that we talked about earlier. So, yeah, let's just hope that the United Kingdom is a, is a, is a shining light in terms of not only maintaining what you have, but pushing for decriminalization of abortion and fully implement uh, fully integrated into reproductive health care mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you you talk about how um, the campaign for marriage equality in Ireland laid some of the groundwork for the repeal campaign um, and I'm wondering whether there are parallels here um, between the two campaigns that the left should consider and the success of the campaigns that the left should consider you know some LGBTQ activists will argue that the success of the campaigns for marriage equality in the UK, in Ireland, had a kind of neutralising effect on the movement because, you know, it reinforced heteronormativity and sort of religious hegemony uh, by presenting marriage as the kind of ultimate life aspiration for all people, straight and gay. And I'm wondering whether there are any uh, parallels here with repealing the eighth in that maybe it had a similarly neutralizing effect um, by kind of risking promoting abortion as a sort of single issue campaign divorced from the broader struggles for health justice. And, you know, the kind of liberalism of the campaign for marriage equality and perhaps for abortion um, risks kind of neutralizing struggles for broader health justice in this case? What a good question. Who knows? Again, I think the thing about the referendum to introduce same-sex marriage in Ireland was it was the fact that it was introduced by popular vote and it was the first country in the world to introduce same-sex marriage by popular vote. So I think the big um, takeaway was people power more than anything else. It really gave people the sense, oh, wow, we can actually make Ireland a better place. We do actually have some power. But I agree. I mean, that notion of homonormativity, you know, that it's okay to be, uh, you know, to be like marriage is the ultimate goal for everybody. You know, I think that is a message that we that we really need to fight against. I think that it is something that we have to continually push within these movements. It, it, they are questions that we need to continually raise and push against. I mean, Ireland, Leo Varadkar, who you mentioned earlier, is a, a gay man, um, first he's gay and migrant, and he is possibly one of the most conservative politicians that Ireland has produced in many years in the past. He has even spoken out against um, same-sex couples being able to adopt children. I mean, this is going way back into the past now. He may have changed his position there, but he's an example of where if you hold the liberal line, it, it brings you into, you know, real difficulties in, in, in how you sustain it. And it really is a line that's linked to, you know, advanced capitalism, to the role of the family in, as an economic unit. You know, this is why the family is promoted because... How else are we going to create, you know, the workers of the future? How else are we going to care for children that are produced? So the family is an economic unit and it is within the interests of right wing politicians and their supporters to to keep that. So, yes, part of the struggle is to 
I guess if we are in those united front spaces, like the Together for Yes campaign, it is to raise important questions. So in Ireland, you had an organization called ROSA, who were part of Together for Yes. They would be linked to their socialist feminist organization, but they also criticized them at the same time. They also ran their own campaign uh, alongside Together for Yes. And I think that's what left-wing activists within united front movements need to do, be it uh, marriage equality, be it abortion rights. We need to be in the space, but we also need to critique the space while we're there, because it's an easy argument to win with a lot of people. I mean, my body, my choice is so ingrained in how we think, but most people, if you just break that down a little bit and talk about housing, jobs, migration, they get it very quickly. People get it very quickly and are on board very quickly. It's not a difficult argument to win. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, so do you think there's a risk then that um, the conversation remains fixed on abortion, um, important as it is, um, without kind of plugging it into the much broader issues about migration, incarceration, racism, poverty, inequality, and that you know, even though those arguments, as you say, are winnable and we can persuade people that, you know, migrant women are more at risk by, um, you know, from an abortion ban and incarcerated women, you know, and, and poorer women, et cetera, that we, um, that we think, oh, no, these, these arguments are too difficult to have. Or if you're, you know, liberal, perhaps you don't even want to have them um, because you're not actually invested in, in that kind of real um social justice um and and that like by okay we've won abortion now all we need to do is protect that right and maybe extend that right increase the number of weeks that people can have abortions or the reasons that they can have abortions rather than you know rolling out this campaign to look at like what are all the circumstances that constrain people and women's reproductive rights and and reproductive um health it really comes back to what you think feminism is, doesn't it? It really comes back to, as you say, that liberal view. And this has always been a tension within women's rights, within feminism. Do you support that kind of lean in idea where it is, you know, every woman for themselves? Do you celebrate victories like um, women who, you know, I mean, do you celebrate Margaret Thatcher's? you know, historic place in history because she was a woman? Or do you criticize and say, well, many of the policies that she and other women on the right have introduced have had serious, serious impacts. So I think we need to continue to fight against liberal feminism. I need to, I think there are, I would have much more in common and ally much more with, with men and non-binary people who are, on the same political wavelength in terms of all of those bigger issues that we have. And I think we need to come out of this silos of men versus women, which is actually seems to be growing in the United Kingdom and, and in some other parts of the world in the context of um, trans rights. We need to really move away from this binary division of men and women, this idea that abortion is a, is a woman's concern. We need to really blow that asunder and really, you know, problematize liberal feminism. So I don't celebrate when a woman is voted into government. I think there's a big issue about the how the barriers that are in place for many women. But, you know, someone like Joan Burton in Ireland, who I speak about in my in my book, the leader of the Labour Party, implemented, you know, really harsh austerity for which impacted uh, very poor women in Ireland. So we need to move away from this idea of a unitist feminist approach. And we need to say, no, there's, there's, there's very different opinions within that spectrum of feminism and call out liberal feminism for what it is, which is um, people getting ahead on the backs of poorer women. So many of the women who succeed in society, you know, who do they have cleaning their homes? How do they outsource what was traditionally their work? To other poorer women, we haven't changed the structures of society. All we've done is allowed for privileged women to, to sit at the table and many others not. 
I'm not sure if I'm answering your questions. It's perfect. No, this is like you're you're covering so much ground. I mean, I think the best um, summary of liberalism that I've ever heard, which maybe um, relates to what you were saying just there, is it's it's people getting a bigger slice of the poisoned pie. You know, women asking for more power in a broken system uh, that subjugates in, in, in this case, other women. Yeah, they want to share power, share neoliberal power. And personally, I don't want to be part of that. You know, I don't think that's good for anybody. No, certainly not the listeners of this podcast. Um, well, yeah, I have a question which is slightly um, different, which is about the role the Catholic Church played in banning abortion in Ireland, which is very particular because, as you say, this this is what plugs the issue of abortion into the entirety of reproductive health and gender equality in Ireland. As you say, from from kind of maudlin laundries to, um, you know, the constraints that the Catholic Church has put on um, women in in so many ways, you know, divorce was only legalised in Ireland in the 90s, I think it was. And you, you you quote the Irish journalist Fintan O'Toole saying that the anti-abortion campaign in Ireland was actually just one front of a wider religious war. Um, but I'm wondering, as someone who knows about abortion movements, not just in Ireland, um, but around the world, and someone who's given this a lot of thought outside of that specific national context, do you think that the church is a necessary component of successful or unsuccessful anti-abortion movements? Or can you imagine abortion rights being targeted outside, by those outside of the religious right? You know, I'm thinking about what you say in the book about how the anti-abortion religious right sprang into action in Ireland in reaction to a perceived liberalisation of Irish life in the 60s and 70s. And it's made me think, I guess, about the kind of anti-woke but very secular right um, in the UK, in Ireland, in America, for example, um, which is responding to the exact same kind of liberalising forces, particularly around issues of gender and sexuality, you know, transphobia (laughs) and and kind of Britain becoming this kind of turf island. Do you think that, you know, the war on reproductive health has to be driven by the religious right? I think the religious right has hugely changed. So the religious right in Ireland historically were people who wore priests' collars and and nuns in veils. And you're right, they played a significant role in Ireland. Uh, To speak personally, so my mother had 10 children and never had access to contraception, probably would have divorced if she could have. And very much lived, I remember my mother saying, I remember saying to her, why do you go to mass? And she said, I'd be afraid I'd get struck by lightning if I didn't. So that is the level of control that the Catholic Church wielded in Ireland. It really, really was. It wasn't, Ireland wasn't a theocracy, but it was as close to being a theocracy as you can come. It was a very, very cozy coalition between the Catholic Church and the Irish church so some t- and, and the Irish state. So people often say when we got rid of the Brits, we brought in the Catholic church instead. So the colonization of Ireland continued um, through, through the Catholic church. I think the right, uh, the, the current right, which much of which has emerged from the United States. I mean, the Catholic church only took a stance on abortion in 1869. That's very recent. The, uh, the the moral argument only emerged in the mid 1800s. I think you have to look at the other things that the religious right are against. So it is that preservation of a fake world that has never existed, where we all live happily in these, you know, family units. And I honestly do believe that the reasons why governments allow that to continue and don't challenge that. So someone like, if you look at um, George W. Bush and the neoconservative movement, you know, why are they so happy to ally with these very, very extreme ideas? I do think it comes back to economics and I do think it comes back to the, you know, the, the implications of, you know, getting rid of the nuclear family, the implications of questioning heteronormativity it has a, a political implication. 
I think the right, I will never understand the arguments of the right. I, I try not to even try to because it just seems so wacky for me, some of the some of the things that they come up with and I let them speak for themselves. But I think they're they're going to be there for a while. I think we need to continue to resist and, and fight um, against them. I have a kind of strategic question um, as my penultimate question, um, which is about the rhetoric of the pro-choice movement. And um, we talked a little bit about the individualist rhetoric of the pro-choice movement um, and, and how that can kind of hold it back. Um, but also, I'm interested in the argument that's um, often relied upon in pro-choice rhetoric that a fetus isn't a life um, in the same way that a pregnant person's is, and that therefore, contrary to what the religious right would argue abortion is not killing it's not murder um it's not ending a life um and obviously there are many pro-choice feminists as i'm sure you're aware who disagree with this idea um i'm thinking in particular of um sophie lewis who recently wrote an article for the american magazine the nation um entitled abortion involves killing and that's okay um and you actually say in your book that infanticide has actually been part of women's experience for a very long time. Women have killed not just unborn children, but but born children um, who may can't care for for various reasons. Um, and I'm interested in why you think the argument, you know, that abortion is killing, but that the person who's responsible for the care of the fetus and or of the future child should be allowed to, to do that killing. Why is that so rarely heard in the public discourse um, on abortion? You, you mention in your book about the fear that repeal campaigners and door knockers had uh, about stating what they really believed in and a kind of imperative to sort of say what they needed to say in order to win votes. Mm. Interested in that um, tension. I, I think it's disingenuous to imply that abortion doesn't involve ending a heartbeat. I think we have to acknowledge that, that if you terminate a pregnancy, you are ending, there is a heartbeat and you are ending that heartbeat. So you are ending the potential for life. It isn't life at that stage. It cannot survive outside of the uterus. So it isn't life, but certainly you are ending the potential for life. I also think that it is very possible to be part of a reproductive justice movement and to be morally against abortion because of that reason. I don't have a problem with that at all. For me, I keep coming back to the fact that this is a reality. So whether there is a moral argument at the heart of it or not doesn't change the fact that people find themselves in desperate situations often, and that is the only the only option. And I mean, I don't want to make out that every abortion is because somebody is in absolute crisis. I think abortion has allowed women to, you know, avail of lots of life opportunities that were denied to them otherwise. But I think there you are ending a heartbeat. I think let's be clear about that. But let's also say there is evidence within the Bible. There is evidence within Islamic scripture. There is evidence um, within Judaism, that this has always happened. So why this is just a reality. We just have to face this reality that, that not every pregnancy results in a child. Sometimes that's because of spontaneous miscarriage. Sometimes that's because of an induced miscarriage, such as abortion. Sometimes, as you say, and very much in the history of Ireland, not only was there infanticide, which still happens, we have still had some cases recently in Ireland and in other countries of, uh, there was a, a baby's body found on a beach in Ireland not too long ago. Um, but also there was a history of people giving away their children. And I know this is happening a lot globally at the moment, that people are literally just in such dire straits that they're handing children to people and saying, please, take this child. So again, it always comes back. If we could raise the base standard of living for people, we would be having this discussion within a very different context. And also, you know, look at things like contraception in a real way. So make contraception, um, you know, 
available on demand, not in a way that there are restrictions and barriers. And let's try and, you know, reduce the numbers of people who need to access abortion to that route. I mean, why is the pro-life movement against contraception? What is that all about? And why is it not against IVF, for example, yeah. in a lot of cases, as you as you say in your book, you know, that yeah. involves creating lots of potential lives, lots of embryos and killing, if that's their argument, many of the embryos that are not necessary for a pregnancy. So um, so, yeah, there's a there's a mismatch there between um the kind of rhetoric and and like the reality. Um, but I think that, you know, perhaps goes to show that n- this isn't about a moral argument of killing um, or, you know, killing a fetus or not. It's about constraining a person's right to choose what they do with their body and with their life um, and, and, and kind of forcing people down a route of reproducing a particular kind of family unit. So if they want to kill uh, fetuses in the service of creating a family unit through IVF, for example, then that's great. But if they want to do it in the service of not having a nuclear family unit, uh, then we have to ban it. Yeah. And I just think it is an argument we will never win. I think we could stay in that moral realm forever. And I would much prefer to ask people who are, who are, who try, who insist on bringing us back there all of the time. I would like to ask them about the supports they provide for severely disabled children who are born, you know, and say, well, how are we, you know, you're saying that this person needs to progress with this pregnancy. So what happens for for the first year of that child's life? You know, who is going to pay for their care? Who is going to give up their lives? Who is going to manage their pain? All of those things, you know, in Ireland, we only allow abortion for fetal fatal anomaly. Um, and two doctors have to sign off that a baby will die within 28 days, which is an absolute impossible task for doctors to do. So this is the this is the nonsense that we end up embroiled in rather than just facing the reality that abortion has always happened. It will always happen if you uh, criminalize it or if you put barriers in place. It simply makes it more expensive, more dangerous. It doesn't in any way stop it. And, you know, again, I mentioned it at the very beginning, but abortion pills have completely changed everything. They have completely changed the landscape here. If you look at the United States, the figures are dropping. So sometimes the anti-abortion movement will say, oh, it's working. Our, Our restrictions are working. But we don't have any figures for the amount of people who are using aid access, for the amount of pills that are circulating, which were huge amounts of pills circulating in Ireland. Uh, You know, many of the organizations I've mentioned actively involved in in smuggling abortion pills in and in circulating them. So abortions are happening. They're happening all the time. And those people then who take a pill, who have a bleed, they're afraid to go to a doctor. They're afraid to go to a hospital. So let's get out of the muddiness of that moral argument. Let's just say, right, we're never going to agree on this, but how do we face the reality and and improve things? Yeah, yeah. There's an anecdote that you recount at the end of the book. This is my last question, by the way, um, that you say that at a celebration for the um, granting of marriage equality in Ireland, um, someone stood up and said, right, next we repeal the eighth. Um, and I'm interested in what the what the new terrain is of gender and health justice in Ireland and how activists might kind of navigate that terrain differently, having been through the experience of repealing the eighth. Mm. There is a system in Ireland called direct provision, which is how we um, house people who come to Ireland seeking asylum. And it is very similar to many of the institutions of the past in Ireland, mother and baby's homes, uh, Magdalen Laundries. Many people say that they are Ireland's today's Magdalen Laundries. I think there has been a sustained pressure from very many of the same people involved in the repeal movement. Uh, we have already had an announcement from the government that they will abolish direct provision. Uh, it hasn't happened yet, but that is certainly something. 
And also that uh, much broader cost of living crisis and huge housing crisis. So there is a national demonstration happening in Ireland the same day as the abortion rights campaign are holding uh, uh, their annual demonstration. So there will be many of the same people will be in both spaces. The they had those two groups are collaborating to make sure that the demonstrations aren't happening simultaneously again to try and build momentum for cost of living and uh, really to look at you know the the obscene profits that are being made by energy companies uh, amidst all this talk of people buying clothes horses and turning off your tumble dryer and nobody's talking about these massive profits so so we are still active in the reproductive rights space, but expanding that into direct provision. There are groups really leading on this and also into that broader uh, cost of living debate. And Ireland does have a reasonably healthy political left through organisations like People Before Profit and the Socialist Party, who manage to operate in Irish Parliament and outside of Irish, Irish Parliament and continue, continue to do that. Thank you so much, Camilla. It's been a total pleasure to talk to you and and to touch on some of the themes of your book, details of which will be in the show notes. But thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode of Navara FM, subscribe to us in your podcast app. And if you're shocked to discover that abortion is a crime in the UK, you're not alone. Check out Sophie K. Rose's story on the issue, aptly entitled Abortion is a Crime in the UK, from May this year on navaramedia.com.